This is the 2016 Next Step Medicine section, Chapter 2. Again, the chapter will begin with some wordy stuff, talking about your immune globulins, your vaccinations. Keep in mind the um, counseling requirement <clears throat> for your different component administration codes. Case 2-1 is a Medicare patient. That should um, immediately trigger you thinking about having to use the Hicks Picks uh, book. So this is for a flu shot. So you're going to get your administration code out of the Hicks Picks. For ICD-10, all of your diagnosis codes for vaccinations and immunizations, or 99.9% .9 of them, is Z23. This is much changed from um, ICD-9, if you knew ICD-9 at all. So for ICD-10, Z23 is probably going to be your diagnosis code for all immunizations and vaccinations. Case 2-2, same thing, Medicare patient. This patient is getting the flu shot and is getting the pneumonia shot. You'll need two administration codes. 2-3, this is um, a 10-year-old, so they're getting their regular vaccina vaccinations for their age. There's no documentation of counseling, so <clears throat> the MMRV that they get will have one administration code with it with no components, so you'll have to find the right one for that. Moving into hydration, 2-4. This patient is getting a therapeutic infusion of saline. This is, <coughs> it's actually dextrose. It's for dehydration. It lasts 50 minutes. You'll need all of that information to plug in. You'll use, <coughs> excuse me, you'll use your J code. Um, to find your or to document your dextrose, your IV fluid medication. <laughs> Good wordy stuff regarding your hydration code, um, your IV codes, hydration and therapeutic, whether they're IV push, um, injection, or installation or infusion. 2 5, <clears throat> this is another shot. They're going to get an injection of tetracycline for a respiratory, uh, upper respiratory infection. Pretty straightforward. Make sure you get your tetracycline drug out of the Hicks Picks because it'll be a J code. <clears throat> Moving into psych, a little bit of wordy stuff. Here is a psych eval. They're also doing some testing. So here's the eval. Here's the testing, and then here's the impression. So uh, your evaluation will be one code. Your testing, they're copying uh, simple figures, and they're doing a nine-word categorized list, testing that oh, verbal learning, I think is what it's called. <clears throat> so there's two testings. That'll make whatever code you come up with times two. The reason um, for the psych eval is the patient has like post-concussion post syndrome. Now, I do see that this patient is also um, on the ventilator. So I would add, if the ventilator is current today, I would add the Z99.1 to that. <coughs> Moving excuse me, moving into dialysis. Remember, dialysis is typically billed on a monthly basis. You have dialysis so many times a week for that month. This is a hemodialysis report. Remember, you have two kinds of dialysis, peritoneal and hemo. This patient has chronic renal failure slash end-stage renal. I would always code it to the end-stage. 
they have had a nephrectomy, so that's going to be a status code for the absence of that kidney. They have diabetic nephropathy, nephro meaning uh, renal or kidney, so a disease process of the kidneys because of diabetes. So that's going to be a combo code. They have hypertension. Remember on any chart that you have hypertension and you have CKD or end-stage renal, you're always going to use that different hypertension code <clears throat> and sequence it first. So you will not use an I-10. You have to use from the I-12 series. They also have multiple electrolyte abnormalities here, and they've got hypothyroid with evidence of taking Synthroid. The rest of this is just kind of words. Okay, so <clears throat> from a CPT standpoint, you need to find your um, ESRD code. The very first code to sequence is the reason why the patient showed up for um, medical care or health care in this moment in time, which is for an encounter for uh, dialysis would not be in stage renal first. They showed up for this moment in time for um, dialysis <coughs> visit. Then, of course, they're having dialysis because of their in stage renal. Because they have the hypertension on here, we've got to sequence next. After the encounter for dialysis, we will sequence next the hypertension. Then we will sequence the in stage renal that's a guideline rule, how you sequence those. Then we've got to do our diabetes with nephropathy. The rest of these doesn't necessarily matter um, sequence-wise. I still kind of sequence the most significant or, or what might still be um, affecting the care of the patient. Any status codes like this absence of a kidney, I will always sequence last. So I would sequence the diabetes uh, nephropathy. <clears throat> then you can do these any order. Your hyperphosphatemia, your hypocalcemia, uh, your hypothyroidism. That probably needs to kind of be sequenced last as it, the hypothyroid really is not impacting any of the kidney stuff, you know. <clears throat> and then do your status, your Z code for that missing kidney. And there's a pretty good discussion here <clears throat> explaining why it's sequenced like it is. I do sequence it just like how they say here. So that's, that's a bonus. Does show, uh, talk a little bit about your peritoneal dialysis. <clears throat> Case 2-8, this is a history and physical exam. There, History and physical exam inpatient means they're being admitted into the hospital. Just lingo, that might be good for you to know. Uh, and then it tells you 79-year-old admitted because of acute peritonitis due to the peritoneal dialysis. So this patient has peritonitis because of her um, <clears throat> peritoneal dialysis, probably the catheter. And again, the clinical impression, acute peritonitis resulting from peritoneal dialysis and end-stage renal due to hypertension. <coughs> These other diagnoses, I did not see that they were really addressed, nor would they play a role in why uh, she's being uh, admitted. So I didn't mess with um, coding them. So determine your um, admit or your going into uh, the hospital code level. I would sequence first and it'll be a T code. This patient has an infection, peritonitis, itis is an inflammation, peri, um, peri is around, um, <coughs> tony or tone is the abdomen, so she's got a abdominal infection in the peritoneal area because of this peritoneal dialysis. So I would <clears throat> find the T code that says the patient has an infection from a catheter, from an implanted device, 
I don't know exactly what that code's going to say. But her, they have linked the infection, the peritonitis that she has, to her dialysis, which is a catheter surgically um, put in. Then you're going to have your peritonitis code. So first you're going to establish there's a complication because of the tubing. And they've said that it, re it has resulted from that catheter, that dialysis yeah. catheter. Then you're going to state what that infection is, which is peritonitis. Then you kind of state um, why the patient had the uh, um, catheter to begin with, and that would be your hypertension and then your end-stage renal. So that's how I would. So the picture that we have painted is patient is coming in because she has an infection from her implanted device. Um, specifically, the infection is peritonitis, and she has the implanted device because she has hypertension, which has caused her end-stage renal. Does talk some <coughs> about your complications here. B, eight B is the same lady. This is um, a progress note for the peritoneal dialysis. It states. CAPD, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, is what that stands for, CAPD. Uh, hypertensive end-stage renal disease. <clears throat> Since this note is completely for dialysis, you have to kind of flip your codes. It wouldn't be appropriate to put your complication or your infection code in because this note is for the, the diabetes. So you have to use a diagnosis code that will justify the medical necessity for this moment in time. So I would do your hypertension and end-stage renal. Then I would do the acute peritonitis due to the peritoneal dialysis um, <coughs> catheter and do that complication first. So we just kind of flipped them because of this moment in time. 8C, again, same patient. This is another dialysis note, so keep in mind the focus of this moment in time. Always, always code for the current moment in time and justify why the patient has encountered healthcare for that moment in time. 8D, this is thoracic medicine, CAPD. I'm not exactly sure why they've thrown the thoracic medicine in here. To some extent, uh, they're probably <coughs> evaluating her for some secondary infections. But this note is clearly a dialysis note. So I would just keep with the same diagnosis. Same thing here. Dialysis progress, dialysis progress. When you see that that infection has dropped away or it has resolved, quit coding it. And I think you may see that by F. 8G, this is a discharge summary. Remember, we only have two codes to choose from. <coughs> think back about why the patient was put in the hospital. She wasn't put in the hospital for dialysis. She was put in the hospital because of the infection. So do your T code and then your uh, peritonitis code. They did determine that it was a strep infection. So at this point, I would add it's a B code, and then do your hypertension and your uh, end-stage renal. <coughs> okay. Non-vascular, 2-9. Duplex, carotid. Again, underneath your cases, you have a little bit of um, <coughs> clarification about what the specific situation is, solely because you do not have a whole chart in front of you. Patient is uh, in because they have or they're having the carotid done because of the rapid ventricular rate, that's tachycardia. Rapid rate, fast, would be tachycardia. Late effects, these uh, are now in the ICD-10 world called sequela. So kind of keep that in mind. I do find myself still talking about late effects, but the up-to-date um, terminology for 
in the nine world, what equates to late effects in the ten world is sequela. So your seventh, <coughs> your seventh uh, digit um, would, if you're dealing with the late effect, would probably be S for sequela. Two ten. This is another carotid study. Um, <coughs> this patient, 30 years old, suffered a st uh, stroke a month ago and has resultant right hemoparesis in aphasia. Essentially what a late effect or a sequela is, is what if you have had a heart attack, stroke, <coughs> motor vehicle accident, fracture, those that event has completely healed or you're past the acute phase of it, do you as the patient have any residual effects from that disease process, that accident or that injury? If, if there is a res residual effect, then that is considered a late effect or a sequela. For this patient, that stroke, the acute phase of the stroke is gone. So now this patient has a resultant or a residual side effect of right hemoparesis in aphasia. So <clears throat> they're having this checked out. So find your um, carotid ultrasound or duplex for this. Remember your modifiers. And then from a diagnosing standpoint, you're going to have a late effect of the hemoparesis. I'll give you a hint. Your late effects or your residual sequela are going to be in the I-69 area. I-69. So they're coming in today because of the hemoparesis and the aphasia residual. They also find today some stenosis on the right side of that carotid, some occlusion. So that's going to be a current, not an I-69. It's going to be a current code out of the I-65 series. <clears throat> but try to crosswalk all of these, even when I give you hints, try to crosswalk all of these diagnosis codes yourself. And then if you have trouble crosswalking them, we can talk about them on the calls. But if you crosswalk them yourself, you're going to have a much better chance at um, finding them again instead of just taking my cheats. 211 arterial Doppler test. This is going to be for both legs. Clinical symptoms are diabetes and pain in the left leg. <clears throat> now I'll take that back. They only did the left leg here. The conclusion says they probably have disease in both legs, but it's quite severe in the left. So make sure your focus on your diagnosis code is that of the left leg. The probably makes us not be able to use any kind of peripheral vascular disease or anything like that because from an outpatient physician-based coding, we cannot code probably. <clears throat> so you're going to have to go back to pain in that left leg and then diabetes. And he, this patient may be uh, fixing to get diagnosed with some kind of peripheral vascular disease because of their diabetes. We just don't know yet. Again, we're coding this moment in time. But I would assume in the future, this diabetes code will probably change to diabetes with complication of circulatory or something like that. <coughs> but we don't have that yet. Case 212, vascular lab report. Arterial Doppler again, leg pain. Patient does have a known coronary artery disease. So um, <clears throat> again, find um, the right code for your uh, leg, whether it's right or left. And then do your CAD here. Cardioversion, just a little bit of that. This is case 213. This is an electrical cardioversion. Patient has atrial flutter. Another little tidbit, anytime you have a pre-op diagnosis and a post-op diagnosis, always, always code from the post-op. Pre-op, sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're different. Always code from the post-op. Post-op diagnosis, 
means that after whatever procedure was done, your doctor has a much better idea of what was going on. If they're the same, then the doctor had a good guess to begin with. <clears throat> this one's not too hard. Your diagnosis codes your atrial flutter, and then you need your cardio version from uh, your CPT. Ultrasound, diagnostic ultrasound, <coughs> is this area. This is an ultrasound of the lower extremities. It's going to be bilateral. And you're going to have to default back to the bilateral edema because there's no evidence of DVT. There's no um, uh, definitive diagnosis of anything else. So they just have um, bilateral edema. Okay, a little bit of wordy stuff. This will kind of help you on some of your diagnosing, especially of Alzheimer's. Cognitive function assessment, this is 215. This has taken two hours, so make sure that your code accounts for that two hours. This patient has senile dementia with depression. Make sure you find that combination code in your ICD-10. I think you will find that this one actually isn't that difficult. <clears throat> 16A behavior assessment. This patient has chronic nail biting. They're just a kid, 13 years old. Initial assessment was 45 minutes. Make sure that your code um, accounts for the full 45 minutes. Your code may be 15 minute increments, so make sure that you're doing at times whatever you may need to. And then nail biting. <clears throat> Getting into chemotherapy, 217A infusion for multiple myeloma, 50 minutes, patient is getting chemotherapy. So you will need to get your chemotherapy infusion code, J code for the specific um, substance, medication going in. ICD-10 wise, for this moment in time, the patient, patient has shown up for an encounter for chemotherapy. Yes, they have cancer. But remember, we, we are painting a picture to be as accurate as possible. So for this moment in time, our first listed diagnosis is going to be encounter for chemotherapy. Then you give the cancer code that supports why the patient is getting chemotherapy. It just paints a more accurate picture. Photodynamic therapy, 218A. There's three sessions to be reported here, so make sure you're doing a times three. You're going to need a J code for the specific substance. And then your diagnosis, I believe, is at actinic keratosis of the lip. 219, physical therapy eval. Physical therapy, just like dialysis, just like chemotherapy, when the patient shows up in that moment of time for a therapy, physical therapy, or occupational therapy, speech therapy, whatever it is, your first listed diagnosis code has to be that encounter for the therapy. Then you list why there are the reasons why the therapy was ordered. This patient's outpatient rehab, they need physical therapy after knee repair. So you're going to actually, patient has degenerative art, uh, osteoarthritis and they've had a knee repair. So not only do they have arthritis, this is also aftercare, after a surgery, <coughs> specifically orthopedic. So you will have three diagnosis codes here. How do you sequence those? Obviously first is going to be the encounter for physical therapy. Then um, it's kind of up to you. I personally would um, do, since they're having physical therapy after the knee repair, I would actually do the aftercare, orthopedic aftercare surgery code. So there would be two Z codes together, and then I would put my osteoarthritis last. I think the uh, book 
um, sequencing has the osteoarthritis and then that aftercare. So as long as you get your first listed okay, you're probably good to go. It's only inpatient that you that it really matters about your um, principal diagnosis, your POAs, all of that. There's a real sequencing that could be 10 or 12 codes deep. Outpatient, not quite as critical. So that's what I would do. Case 220, physical therapy and vow. This patient is a quadriplegic. So that's going to matter. That means they're wheelchair bound. They're dependent on a wheelchair. That's going to be a Z code as a status. <coughs> so find your, <coughs> excuse me, I'm so sorry. Find your physical therapy code. Use your Z code for why they're showing up today. Then you're going to have um, <coughs> your, your G code. And I'm just going to kind of let you find out what that G code is. But then your last code would be the status of being dependent on a wheelchair. And this is all the same patient in here. Again, uh, this is a physical therapy eval. I did not find anything specific to uh, the wheelchair in here, so I did not use a Z code for the for wheelchair dependence. I'm not going to assume anything. This uh, um, <clears throat> is actually a fitting for an orthotic. She's having problems with her ankle, and it took 30 minutes, so you may need to um, double your 15-minute increment. Just check and see. Here's your physical <clears throat> eval. Um, I'm not crazy about how they've written this entire case, the 220. Just do the best that you can with it. Again, on 20C, you're going to see that she's dependent on a wheelchair. I think her dad's helping move her around some. <clears throat> Then you're going to have your G code. So they showed up for the physical therapy, which is a Z code. Then your G code for specifically why she is in the wheelchair, which I'm not going to tell you. You've got to figure that out. And then another Z code for being dependent on that wheelchair. All right. Case 221. This is an office procedure. Patient has ingrown um, toenails both of the great toes, so this is bilateral, there's a mirror image of them. The right and left feet were prepped. So you're going to go to your skin section to get your procedure code here. Make sure you're using your Hicks Picks modifiers for the uh, right great toe and the left great toe. <clears throat> I would also use a 51 modifier. And the reason I would even though the doctor is making two separate incisions, the diagnosis code <coughs> is ingrown toenail. So because the diagnosis code is the same for both of them, I would use a 51 modifier on one of them to show um, multiple procedures. It's not like one is separate and identifiable. This is multiple procedures, the same diagnosis code. The doctor knows exactly what he's doing. One, he's doing the same thing on the other one. Um, and I don't think that this justifies him getting paid 100% for both of them. He's prepping them the same at the same time, probably in the same um, uh, a surgical field, both the toes will be sitting there, so it's not like he's really doing separate and identifiable procedures. But the key here is that the diagnosis code um, is going to be the same for both of the procedures. You don't even have a different diagnosis code that you can justify and say, well, look here, he had ingrown toenail here and he's got you know, uh, actinic keratosis over here. They're both skin issues, you know, per se, um, but you don't have a difference of diagnosis code. So you probably should uh, use the 51 modifier um, just to alleviate any problems. 21B, this is <clears throat> a good um, example We've not talked about the, the CPT code. It's 99024. 
And if you go and look at that, you're going to need to make some notes, kind of flag it, that 99024 is a no charge code that physicians use at the end of a global period and it kind of flags the insurance company that this global period everything is fine there's no complications and we're done now I'm not going to need to see the patient for this anymore so for ingrown toenail surgical package could be 10 days 14 days I don't know 30 days um, it depends on the insurance that they have so this patient has come back in for a recheck following the surgery that they had for that ingrown toenail <coughs> specifically to check how that uh, ingrown toenail surgery has um, progressed there's no complications everything is normal um, they're, they're good to go they're supposed to continue their soaks and stuff uh, and in two weeks they'll have another post-op check that'll be free as well 99024 unless there's some kind of complication so from a diagnosing standpoint you're going to use a Z code for aftercare after surgery on the skin I'm just kind of giving you a hint there hopefully the hints that I give you you will take that information make your notes and you can kind of start getting your mind into the kind of thinking you got to have in order to code accurately. It's just kind of a different kind of mindset. Then we go into our auditing <coughs> reviews. These, again, are great for you to read, see how they coded it, and see if you can find their mistake. Once in a while, they don't have a mistake. Sometimes they do have a mistake. Okay, so this is really good uh, practice for you. So that was the medicine section, yay for us. And the next will be radiology.